Debbie, I think you're all set. All right. Um, hello, everybody, and, and welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Debbie Williams Hoke. I think a lot of you know me and hopefully uh, um, recognize me. And just so grateful that you've decided to join us tonight for the Zoom. We're so fortunate to have the folks from RSA Consulting with us. And as I mentioned in my emails to all of you, I had the opportunity to get exposed to them through the LPGA. And I had mentioned as well that with some of my student athletes, I'd had exposure to recruiting companies and and it was not a good a good situation. And so when I first heard about a webinar with another recruiting agency, I have to be honest, I was skeptical. But after after hearing everything that was said and and uh, just getting to know the members of RSA Consulting, I am just uh, so impressed with everything that they do. First and foremost, they have the highest degree of honesty and integrity with with what they do, and 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 they really have an unbelievable personal touch with parents and with student athletes, and they are totally committed to doing what is in the best interest of the student athlete and the parents. And uh, so, just very impressed with them, and and feel so confident about passing along their information to you and and getting them to speak to you tonight, so that hopefully. Uh, in the future, when you have student athletes that want to play at the next level, uh, you have a great resource in them. And and I'm sure they'll mention it, but just when you think about your athletes playing at the next level, realize there's so many opportunities out there um, from Division One on down. And and so you don't have to have a student athlete that's just elite to play at the next level. And, and certainly um, they will talk about it. So I'm going to turn it over to Tanya Olson, who's who's the um, in charge of this. And uh, Enjoy this evening. Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Tanya Olson, and I am co-owner and director of golf of RSA Consulting. Um, I've been in the recruiting world, if you will, for about 15 years. Um, the first 10 of that was with a very large company, and I kept asking for change and asking for change, and nothing was happening. So I kind of ripped off the Band-Aid, if you will, and um, myself and four others started RSA. And the best way to describe that is boutique style. We really listen to what the athlete and parent is looking for and what they want in the process and really make it personal. Um, this is a really big decision moving forward in an athlete's life. And if you're misguided, misdirected, or do nothing, then it's, it's wasted time. So we really hang our hat on morals and ethics, and that's what drives our company, and I'm very proud of what we've created. Mary's been with me for two and a half years now, and it was the best thing I ever did. Um, I also have two other ladies with me that are former coaches as well, with over, actually three ladies as of just last week, um, with over 100 years of coaching experience. So really proud of that as well. So I come from the consulting background. I've always been in the golf world. I played Division I golf at South Florida. I then worked at PGA National um, under Mike Adams for a little bit and then moved up to the Chicago area. So always been in the golf industry. And um, as I said, 15 years ago, started the consulting world and I love it. I, it it's a passion of mine, um, being able to help young adults achieve a goal, which is very minimal as far as what people do. It's really a cool club to be in as far as that college athlete. Um, I, I felt very fortunate to have the opportunity to do that and be a part of that club um, and helping guide people it was in the mid nineties when it was a lot different. I mean, most of you probably don't even know what a VHS tape was, but mm -hmm. that's what the world that we lived in at the time. So much different than what it is now. Now the rules are different. The regulations are different. Um, now we have to have the NCAA on speed dial just to keep up with everything, which we do actually. So um, I, I really enjoy guiding these families. And as Debbie said, we work with all divisions. It's not just D1. Um, that is not our measuring stick. Our measuring stick is to find the, the right fit, both academically and athletically. We'll never compromise academics for athletics. And we work with all divisions, finding the right fit for that athlete, that family geographically, size-wise, and everything that that means. So having said that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary now, and she's going to give her, her background a little bit, and then we'll jump right into some great info. 
Thanks, Tanya, and thanks, Debbie, for um, the great introduction and um, trusting us with your coaches and introducing us tonight. Um, so Debbie and I know one another through the LPGA here in the Midwest section. I'm based out of St. Louis, Missouri, um, and I have a background as a college coach. So to start from where Tanya started, she and I played in the late 90s. We like to say separately, but together. So we graduated the same year, but I played in the Ivy League. Um, which back then was more like Division Three is now, um, but had a successful career, got into the golf business very quickly, um, worked for the USGA for a hot minute, and then got into college coaching. Um, and I was a coach at four different universities, a head coach at three, and both in Division One and Division Three. Um, so most recently, um, through um, 2021, I was the head women's golf coach at Washington University in St. Louis, so I still reside in the area. And um, when I'm not helping Tanya and our athletes and families, um, I do have a role with the First Tee program. Here I'm the program director for the First Tee chapter. So I'm very much in the lives of young people, um, ages seven to 18, um, no matter what hat I'm wearing. But um, I was attracted to the opportunity to join RSA for a couple of reasons. Um, I had met Tanya when I was the head coach at Bradley University. Her being based in Chicago area, I was in Peoria, Illinois. I was at the state tournament for um, the girls um, one fall, and she was helping a young lady who I was quite interested in. And we struck up a friendship. I soon realized Tanya's approach was getting to know me as a coach, what I was looking for um, to, um, what kind of athlete I was looking for to bring into my program. She was never contacting me to sell me on a kid like, hey, I got this kid for you. It was more so seeking to understand what my needs were as the head coach. And so consequently, I left Bradley. I ended up at Wash U and, you know, she continued that friendship and we would talk not a lot because, you know, she didn't always have athletes for me, but she was always very thoughtful about the process and learning what I was looking for and what I needed. So when I left coaching, um, I, I knew I had a lot of knowledge from all those years of coaching at the different levels and different divisions. And Tanya invited me to come on um, with her and I met the owners um, and I was just very impressed um, with their approach. I felt like my um, my expectations, my morals and ethics aligned with theirs. And so really it was a no brainer for me. So um, when Tanya and I work, we work together with all of our athletes. We speak with one voice. Um, and really I view this process as very much like what you likely do with your athletes at the high school level and what college coaches do is you help you know an individual athlete set a goal and then work the process to get to that goal. So that's what we do with every athlete we work with. They have a goal um, and they may not know exactly what the outcome is because they're not fully aware of things outside of division one, um, but we help them pave that roadmap and help them navigate those forks in the road where they're unsure or they need some education um, on what route to take. So like Tanya said, at this point, we're covering all divisions, NAIA, and also this world of club golf and professional golf management degrees. Um, and feel really fortunate that, um, you know, we're making it our business to understand all of those areas. So to best help our families. It's, um, it's just so impressive to, to listen to you talk and just the commitment that you have. Um, as you mentioned, there's, there's four ladies that are part of golf, but yet um, explain it. You said, I think when we talked before, you, you actually help more boys than girls and just, you know, in that demographic. Yeah. So to speak to that, Tanya, you're on mute, but I can take the question um, to speak to that. You know, probably not any news to those of you in the room tonight. There are a lot more boys seeking to play at the next level than girls because they're just more playing at the high school level. Um, and so we do, um, we're kind of split and we might have a few more boys right now than girls that we're helping, but that very much indeed is the truth. And Tanya, um, do you want to also kind of briefly introduce our other colleagues who aren't with us tonight and their backgrounds as well? Sure. Um, we have Ginger Lynn Brown, who's in Texas. She coached at Mississippi State. I believe she played at Texas and has 
about 30 years of coaching experience and she's amazing. Um, she's been in, she, she actually came to us, um, kind of like Mary, she was doing this herself and said, I don't want to be by myself. I feel like I'm in an Island on an Island all, all alone. And I want to be with you, great gals. So, um, we brought her on and love having her. And then in the South, we have Erin O'Neill, who's in Florida and she coached at Kansas for a very long time, 17, 18 years, and is now going through PGA and LPGA school. So she's quite busy, um, but getting those classifications. And so we have a lot of people that bring a lot of great information. And our last um, person that we brought on is actually Janet Carl, who formerly coached at Cincinnati. So power five coach, a whole dynamic. I mean, it's just a great group of ladies that we, we like each other. Um, I, again, morals and ethics are all at the top of our list and I couldn't be prouder of the team that we've put together. So. Very cool. So all of us obviously are high school coaches working with, you know, student athletes in that 14 to 18 range, but we all also, a lot of us work with younger players in that what age do you start kind of working with with the student athlete and with the parent and and what's that initial process like yeah that's a great question Debbie thank you so our ideal athlete is actually eighth grade or freshman year and we equate that to building a wedding cake so we're not doing the same thing we're doing with a junior but we're building a good foundation so we're building things that college coaches really um, look for in an athlete, we're instilling those values and habits in that athlete. We read books with them where we call it our own little book club that we go through. We're really working on the mental part of the game too. Mary and I would say eight to 10 months ago, really did a deep dive and took a very large interest in that side of the concept as well. And then it's just about building that great foundation because the second that they say they want to play golf at the next level, there's something you could be doing. It might not be, Hey, what school am I going to, but you can start changing your habits, changing your attitudes to be a college athlete. So with the background that these ladies have, it's awesome that they can say, Hey, I'm going to put my coach's hat on for a second. And I'm going to look at this through a lens of what am I looking at and what am I looking for when I'm talking to these young people? And so to just add to that real briefly, Debbie, a big part of that is scheduling and time management. So, um, you know, we get down to brass tacks and we say, we want you to select a scheduling tool, um, preferably handwritten. Um, we don't care what it looks like. And then they submit it to us on a weekly basis. So again, working with players at the college level who were successful, um, all of those players manage their time really well. And so, you know, coaches and parents, we want to help our kids be more autonomous, right? We want them eventually to fly out of the nest. So that foundational life skill of managing their time is something we really focus on. And honestly, that's kind of the bandwidth of an eighth grader, ninth grader, like that's a good place to start for them. They get that. It's not too overwhelming. And then it helps them to know, okay, if I schedule my, you know, recruiting um, checklist that I need to go over for RSA, it's a little bit less daunting because they've got that habit already instilled because when they do get older, they will have things to do. They'll have schools to research. They'll have um, college lists to compile. We're going to have them doing a lot of things because we want to empower them through this process. That was kind of what I was going to ask. So we have a student athlete and it's like, oh, we want to contact RSA. So, um, you know, they contact you. What can, what in that initial conversation can a parent and student athlete expect to hear? I'm sorry, what, what, you cut out there for a second. What the initial what in conversation? The, yeah, in the initial conversation uh, to you from a student athlete and parent, what can they expect to hear? Yeah, so um, we don't work with everyone. So we have, I don't want to call it an interview, that sounds pretty um, intense, but we 
we love Zoom. So Mary and mm -hmm. I are on Zoom all the time and we would have an initial conversation just like this. We work with clients all over the country. I think that's important to say. Um, we've had Texas, Alabama, um, Indiana, Missouri, Illinois, New York, Pennsylvania. So we're all over the place, but you know, COVID did us a very a, a good favor when they brought Zoom into our lives, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. the first thing that would happen is we would sit down and have a Zoom call just like this. And it would be mom, dad, kid, and Mary and I, uh, and really listen to where they are, what they want, where they want to go, what they've done, what they need to do, and where their gaps are. And really, it's just a conversation. And to know Mary and I is to know that we're our two hot buttons are realistic and proactive. If you're not being both, then you're spinning your wheels in the wrong direction. Um, there are over 1,300 golf programs for kids now in the college system. So that's a lot of programs. They probably don't know about it. And about 300 of those are D1 in the men's world. So there's a lot of options out there that we can open their eyes to. It's just more than what they see on TV. And so they don't know what they don't know. So we try to really engage them and ask questions and get them to think about, okay, what when you think about college, what do you think about? You want a big school, little school, in the middle of nowhere or in a city? I mean, what's important to you? And a lot of times they don't know, and that's fine, but it's our job to whittle it down. And it's our job to ask the right questions at the right time to make sure that they have answered all of those questions at the end of the day when it's time to make that big decision. Could you kind of give all of us as coaches kind of a general score frame that each of the divisions are looking for in, you know, D1 down to AIA or NIA for boys and girls? Like if you want to be a D1 boy player, you should be in this ballpark. If you want to be D2, is, is that possible to do? Well, I'd like to first describe um, the different divisions. And I, I describe it as cylinders. So you've got your cylinder one, two, and three, and then you've got your NAIA cylinder, which is just a different governing body, which has actually been around longer than the NCAA. Most people don't realize that. And then you've got junior college. So unlike other sports, football, baseball specifically, it doesn't, they don't feel like all of this cylinder and then you fill cylinder two and then you fill cylinder three and then you fill cylinder in AI. They fill from the top down. They fill horizontally. So you could look at the top schools. The top NAI schools have an under par scoring average. And that blows people away. They just don't realize that. So that is incredibly eye-opening for a lot of people because they have what we call D1. I'm going D1 or I'm not successful, which simply isn't true. I mean, I could give you many examples of guys on the PGA and LPGA tour that did not play division one golf. So that is debunked completely false. There's many ways to get to the PGA tour rather than being a top level college golf. So having said that, um, if you're looking at that top tier power five, you need to have a lot of red numbers and your scoring average needs to be subpar. So you're looking at 68 to 70, 71, and then it's going to creep up from there. So you're, then you've got your mid majors, which isn't going to be that low. And then you're going to have your lower D ones and then your D twos, you're still going to be at that subpar level because they're under par at the championship level. And then you've got your mid-major D2s, which they're going to be anywhere from 72 to 75, 76. And then you've got your lower D2s. And then your, your D3s, same thing, sub-level till you get down a little ways. And then you're going to be 72 to 77 maybe in that area. And then your NAIA, again, subpar at the top, down a few levels. And then you're going to be... 72 to 79 80 perhaps but that that's a ballpark that is not a blanket answer and i'll say my best success story was a young lady shooting 92 she went to a d2 program in uh, the dc area and got 80 percent scholarship 
So that's my best success story in 15 years because she thought she had no chance of playing college golf and she had a wonderful experience. So um, there's, if you're looking in the right place and you're open to the right um, um, situations, then you're going to have a, a, a lot more and a, a lot more options to you instead of um, being unrealistic and spinning your wheels in the wrong direction. So on the, on the girl side, I have a young lady heading off to a school in Indiana and had talked to her coach and, and she just started out in golf two years ago and, and she's probably in the one twenties, one twenty five, And, uh, you know, I had asked this coach, you know, what numbers are you looking for? And he said, the numbers don't matter if she's going to work hard and, and, uh, loves the game of golf. We'll find a place for her. So a lot of times I try to tell my female student athletes, just as you'd mentioned, there's so many opportunities, but you know, if, if you can shoot 130 or better, um, I kind of use that as a ballpark, there's opportunities for you. Is that does that sound right? Or is that number too high, too low? Um, I think that's a, a that's a bit high, but there are new programs that need people. Um okay. and there are people that, you know, it used to be you know, the number one un, unclaimed scholarship dollar was women's golf. That was right. the thing for ever said. Um, I think that has gone by the wayside a little bit, but there are opportunities out there, again, if you're looking in the right place. So um, it it's, and, and two, it's about the right fit academically and athletically. So um, you have to make sure that those both align. A lot of those higher numbers are going to be smaller private schools that aren't fully funded, probably D3. So your academics have to be super high, which means, and, and Mary and I do a presentation, Golf by Numbers, and one of the things in that is misconceptions. And the number two misconception is grades don't matter, which is simply not accurate, not true. Yeah. So the better you are academically, the more appealing you are to a college coach. I don't care what division it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you had mentioned about uh, the subpar rounds, what what yardages are you typically talking about? You know, for college golf, because obviously we have you know in high school golf such a big difference with the girls playing, you know, five thousand to fifty two to maybe fifty four, and and then when they get on to college, um. And you, and you mentioned about those scores. What yardages are those at? Mary, why don't you yeah. talk about your I experience? can take that on the women's side. So if we start with um, Division One, there's a minimum NCAA yardage that's established for each division. But I will tell you, most teams are playing more than that. And the national championship and the regionals are typically longer. So the, the minimum at D1 is 5,900 but you'll see the championship is closer to 63, 6,400. Um, Division two is going to play their national championship around 62. Um, and I believe their minimum is 58. Um, by the way, NIA, NAIA is also 58 in the women on the women's side. And then division three is actually a range. And this, this was pushed through by one of um, the coaches in my conference a few years ago, and it makes complete sense. It's a sliding scale. So I'm not going to get the numbers exactly right, but a par 70 that has two less par fives, let's just say that's 5,600. I'm pretty close to the number there. Par 71 is going to be around um, 5,700. And then the par 72 is going to be 58. So it's a sliding scale. You you know, all of you slug it around in the late fall or the early spring when the courses are playing a lot longer. And, you know, that 58, 59 can feel really long. Um, and so making it more realistic for the ladies um, to have those shorter par fives um, and have opportunities to go for those in two. Um, Tanya, do you want to go through the men's? Yeah, so to give an example, so the Division One Men's Championship was playing Greyhawk last year at 7,200 and change. Um, if you look it up, it'll say they're 600 to 7,000 to 7,000, but the championship D1 was playing 72 and change. 
So they're not going to vary that much going down. They're going to be in that six to 7,000 range. Um, going to be the higher sixes on the championship side with D2 and D3. But they're not going to go below that. Um, and then we had a question about something that we'll get to in a minute. So Brian, um, thank you for your question, but just hang tight for a second. Um, so back to my cheat sheet here. Um, the timeline for contact. Can you explain that for the different? I know they're different. Mm -hmm. um, so I can take that one. Um, D1 and D2 are very similar or are similar. Um, June 15th, after the sophomore year, is when coaches can start contacting athletes who've just completed that sophomore year. And at the highest level, coaches will call at 12.01 a.m. I mean, it's it's that serious um, or is that exciting, I guess you would say. <laughs> and then, Tanya, is it August 1 or August 15th official visits? I think um, it's August 1. Yes. So August 1st, following the sophomore year is when they can take the official visits. The official visit, by definition, is an in a visit paid for by the institution. So um, Sally or Jimmy, it's the same on the men's and the women's side, division one, division two. Um, they can fly you in. They can pay for your meals, pay for your hotel, pay for a parent, um, free tickets to the, you know, there's nothing going on in August, likely. But um, that's when those official visits can start. They can visit campuses. So you may have kids committing in that time frame. You know, these are the highest level top 50, top 100 kids um, in the national ranking. Um, and then it's the same contact, just so you know, like text, email, and phone calls are all the same. So um, a coach cannot return an email prior to that date, except to say, I can't talk to you. <laughs> so they can be polite and they can acknowledge, um, they can maybe send camp information that is permissible, um, but they cannot converse on the lines of recruiting. The good news is division three, there are no rules. Um, I believe though, if I'm recalling correctly, um, you can, coaches can talk to athletes. They have to have completed their sophomore year to actually talk off campus, but it doesn't matter the age. They can be in seventh grade. Um, division three coaches can text, email, talk on the phone and meet student athletes and their parents on, on visits. Keep in mind, Division Three, the timeline for those athletes is typically later because the academic piece is so important and coaches really can't evaluate. So I'm putting my coach's hat on. I was at Washington University. It's a top 20 school in U.S. News and World Report, very rigorous academics. And I couldn't really recruit kids until I had all of their grades through junior year. So for me to kind of jump the gun and start recruiting a sophomore when I didn't know how they were going to do in school and how they were going to test and testing is coming back. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit, the benefits of testing, even if a school's test optional, you still want your kids to test. Um, really that timeline for division three is so much later because the academic piece is so important because there are no athletic scholarships in division three. It's all academics. Division two and division one, you can combine. And then. Um, Go ahead and mention NAIA. NAIA, I believe there are no restrictions either. So oh, but they can combine. Athletic. Oh, sorry. The, the aid, that's correct. So you can combine athletic and academic aid. And they're kind of the wild, wild west when it comes to recruiting. Um, there's really no restrictions, but they tend to recruit later because. Um, you know, kids kind of hold out for their dream schools and there are not a lot of NAIA schools that, um, you know, kids would choose on the first go around. There are some great options, don't get me wrong, but their timeline is more similar to D3. They recruit a little bit later. They can take kids who maybe are struggling a little bit academically. Um, they can take chances on some kids that some of the other D2 and D1 schools cannot. Um, so hopefully that is helpful. All right. Um, a question here along these lines uh, from one of our coaches, Paul. I just started my school's first girls, girls golf program last year. I have some great underclassmen. Their scoring averages in their first year of golf are in the high 50s to 60s, and they're all 4.0 students. 
what should I tell them they can re realistic, realistically pursue for the next level if they'd like to? Yeah, so high school golf is incredibly important in the developmental stages of the next level. Um, if they, it, and I'm going to kind of pair that with one of the questions above, what should they be playing in to get noticed? Um, and I feel like that you have to be playing in more than just high school to get noticed. And I'll tell you why. So the number one misconception in college athletics, and this is across the board, any, any sport doesn't matter. Number one misconception is if I'm good enough, they'll find me. So, and we have, um, we have proof in the pudding to, to back that up. We had a, a young man, um, in the Midwest this year, he was ranked top 200 in his class and he, there was a coaching change in his dream school, fell through the cracks and he found himself with nowhere to go. A JGA resume that was off the charts. Um, just, it was, it was a perfect storm, not in his favor. So he fell into the trap of, he didn't reach out to schools. He never did. So he fell into a trap of, if I'm good enough, they'll find me. I don't have to do anything. Well, luckily we got him and got him turned around and his sale going in the right direction. So um, that story ended very good. Um, but they, I feel like they do need to be playing in two day events for sure. You have to be playing in more than high school if you want to get noticed at the next level. So two day events are very important. You have to be on the JGS, which is the junior golf scoreboard, which is a national ranking system that athletes do nothing to get on. They're just playing in sanctioned events that are two or three day events with your peers. So it's not your club championship. It's, it's not events such as that. So, um, and that is calculated on a 365 day year. So you have to play in four of those in a 365 day year, not a calendar year. It's a rotating 365 to be on that because those drop off. So um, I, I would tell those young ladies that have a 4.0, if their desire is strong, that they keep working hard and get it down a few more shots that they're, they're going to be fine if they are looking in the right place. Sounds good. I'm um, getting back to uh, when the student athlete, when should a student athlete first reach out to a coach? We hear stories about college coaches, you know, are recruiting four or five, six years, have everybody lined up for the next four or five, six years. We know that, you know, the, the coaches can't reach out till after their sophomore year, but when's a good time for a student athlete? And then what should that contact be and what should be included in that and kind of referencing, um, if, if you send a letter to a coach, what should that include, you know, making sure you know the coach's name, that you reference the school, you know, say something about the school. Just what are some things that coaches look for to distinguish a student athlete from another student athlete? So um, a few years ago, the rules changed as far as PSA, potential student athlete, and what that actually meant. So some were defining that as a freshman in high school starts your PSA, your potential student athlete clock ticking. So about six or seven years ago, coaches were indeed committing eighth graders at the power five level before they became PSAs. And that was completely legal because they hadn't reached, they hadn't enrolled in that ninth grade season yet. So they weren't, they were in this gray area of a PSA. So they've done away with that a bit because it would got crazy. I mean, there were a lot of power fives that were indeed. I, I, I actually was at an event with the Alabama coach, Jay Sewell, and I was at the same table with him. And I said, Jay, is it true that you're recruiting eighth graders? And he said, yes. And I said, wow. He goes, I have to because everybody else is. So if he didn't, he was going to get left behind. So the rules have changed a little bit. That's why they opened it up to, because the rule used to be, you couldn't take an official visit to your senior year. Well, guess what? Kids were committing way before that. So nobody was taking official visits. So they backed that up a whole year and allowed junior and senior year to be in that mix. So you can now take a lot more official visits than before and see a lot more schools. 
Um, as far as when to reach out, my my whole thing has always been you need to be proactive. You need to tell that coach. You need to learn how to introduce yourself. You need to have, learn how to talk to a coach. You need to learn how to email a coach. And that all comes with the life skills that we kind of build in that foundation of talking to adults. Because there there is a time of awkwardness where you don't want to write an email because that's your first impression, right? So how are you going to write a great email to a coach that you sound like you're interested in them. So you have to do your due diligence first. You have to do a lot of research on that school and then write a good email. So that's a, a large part of what Mary and I do is counseling. We never let an email, we never let a letter go out. We call it, we hold it hostage um, mm -hmm. until we redline it because that is their first that that's their their first impression of that college coach mm -hmm. is going to be that email and it has to be good and it has to be spot on and it has to be in their language not ours but it also has to be appropriately written mm -hmm. um so and kind of along those same lines it, it all has to be done in a timely manner so we we have gotten well we don't do we never have RSA has never done mass emails and we never will. We don't even, they don't even know we exist unless we reach out to one of the coaches that we have contacts with, um, which are several now with all of the, the awesome people that we have working with us um, and say, Hey, what are you looking for? So we're empowering the athlete with the knowledge to be proactive in their own right. So we're empowering them to write a great email and we're empowering them to do some research and to do this with all of our hundred plus years of coaching experience to navigate those waters. And so if, if I could just add, sorry to interrupt Debbie, but um, to answer your question about when, you know, it, it depends on the development of the kid is what I'd say. If you've got a kid who's playing really well as a freshman and has a story to tell, and that young man or young woman has done their research to make some personal connections to the university in their letter, that would be someone, even though a coach may not be able to respond, that doesn't mean you can't get on the coach's radar. Now, to give you perspective on the coach's side of things, I probably got, on average, two to three emails, recruiting emails a day, 365 days a year. You have to absolutely differentiate yourself. If you forget and call the Harvard coach's name by the Princeton coach's name. <laughs> you know, there's so many things that can go wrong. Um, and that's why we hold those letters hostage. Um, really it happens have to all be the time, though. Say that again. It happens all the time. It happens it um, it with people that aren't paying attention. They're just copying and pasting yeah. things. And it's just cookie cutter. Yeah. And a coach can sniff a letter written by a parent and a coach can sniff out or us. Um, and coach can sniff out um, if this is just a copy paste and this is just a general letter that, you know, you sent to 20 schools. Um, really, really important to do your due diligence and make those connections and do your research. That's so good to hear. I had the opportunity um, to work with the University of Michigan coaches years ago to create a letter, just like you mentioned. And, you know, just the little things like instead of dear coach, you know, dear the coach, make yeah. sure you have the name and the school and, and even the mascot. And then if something, find out how that golf team did that year. And if they just won the yes. tens, you know, congratulate them on that. Or, or just like you said, the little things that distinguish you from the hundreds and hundreds of emails that you get. Okay. Going to a word that all of us as coaches sometimes cringe at, and I just cringe myself as I'm thinking of it, parents, a parent <laughs> piece. And, uh, um, what, what, what can parents be doing and what advice do you have for us as coaches to, to, to give to parents that mm -hmm. are gun ho about their next Tiger Woods or Nellie Corda? Um, actually I got to play with Nellie Corda, um, about, <laughs> uh, 10 years ago, her legs came up to here on me, um, <laughs> but it was a really fun experience. I played with her down at the Sally, um, Okay, so parents' role, be supportive. Um, college coaches don't want to hear from you. They wanna hear from your athlete. They want to recruit young adults. Um, they want to recruit 
kids that have been empowered, not, um, not parents that are nagging is no good, um, over, you know, you need to carry your own golf clubs. If you're a girl to the first tee, you can't be doing all the little things like that, putting sunscreen on your kids, um, giving them snacks. Coaches want to recruit young adults and everything that that means that they can take care of themselves, that they can speak for themselves. There is a time and a place in every recruiting process. And it has to do with the financial side when it's appropriate for moms and dads to, to be involved. Um, on a visit and everything like that, because when you're being recruited college and I've heard story after story from many coaches more than I can't even count how many because Mary and I actually do go to events and watch our kids play so we're walking side by side with college coaches which is great um they they're watching parents just as much as they're watching kids um and th there are coaches that actually follow kids and parents to the parking lot to see how their son or daughter is interacting with their mom and dad. How is their mom and dad talking to them? How are they talking to their mom and dad? That whole interaction. Because you have to keep in mind, these college coaches are going to be in a bus for, with them for like five and six hours at a time. They want good kids. So the parents are being recruited just as much as the kids are, for sure. Um, and to add to that, two things. So I was actually listening to a podcast today with, um, his name is Chris Hack. He's the longtime coach at Georgia on the men's side. And his background is AJGA. So he was actually one of, I don't think he was one of the founders, but he was pretty close to that time frame when the AJGA was coming into um, prominence. And so back in, Tanya may remember this, I certainly remember this, AJGA, you used to stay with host housing. Mm -hmm. That was a part of the deal is you wouldn't stay at a hotel, you'd stay with local families. Well, guess what? Mom and dad didn't travel then because you were all taken care of. You flew to the destination and you got picked up. And this was, you know, before the days of all this safe sport and the things we're doing to keep our kids safe. So I think things were a little more relaxed, obviously. But he was basically saying junior golf has changed so much. You know, it's a shame that that model has kind of gone by the wayside. And that was some of his observation as to why things have changed so much and parents have gotten so involved because they now travel with the kids. So that was just a little tidbit that made a lot of sense to me when I heard it. Give them something to read. <laughs> this is yeah. called Golf Parent for the Future. Debbie may have mentioned this book to you, but this is a resource from some colleagues in the industry who were just wonderful, um, Lynn Marriott and Pia Nielsen. This is like a booklet. It's less than 50 pages. It's gonna give some good talking points. Um, you don't have to be the bad guy. Give them something to read. Um, I believe Positive Coaching Alliance, um, that's another great resource. They've got podcasts, they've got articles. Um, they're a really good resource for both college and high school coaches. And I get some of their stuff through first T. I would also look them up um, because again, you may find an article or two that it's just like, I'm going to send this to the parents. <laughs> um, but Debbie, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, technically coaches aren't recruiting parents in the sense of they're building relationships with the kids, but they're very observant and knowing that that parent is a package deal. Um, so eyes are on them as well. And that's so good for us as coaches to know too, to just um, the interactions between the kids and the parents, not only for, for young student athletes that are looking to play golf, but just whatever they're looking to do in the future to have those positive interactions, you know, with their parents says a lot about, you know, what their capabilities are in the future. Um, I was, I was trying to have my book right here close to me too. Uh, <laughs> the golfing parent of the future. It is. It's like the Bible for for golf parents. Um, we had talked briefly before about uh, some of the things that are going on in Michigan with our limited membership of only two events outside of the season for our boys and girls. And um, there is a proposal that will be voted on in May to allow three events for the boys with the addition of the PGA uh, qualifier. But 
we hear as coaches sometimes that players are getting advice from some swing coaches. And if you want to play college golf, don't play high school golf. You're going to miss opportunities and that the only thing you should be focusing on and the only thing that college coaches look at are AJGA tournaments. Can you speak to that? I love this topic um, because it's simply not true. And the AJGA is not the end all be all. Is it the biggest and the best? And, and yeah, your top 2% are playing the AJGAs. Um, but there is a different world and another world outside of the AJGA. And if you try to jump in that world before you're ready, we call that throwing yourself to the wolves and you're not going to have a great experience. So Mary and I are all about creating successes. And a big part of what we do with every family is help create a tournament schedule. So we sit down and say, okay, we look at the body of work and look at what you've played in, look at what your scores are, and how can we create successes for you and good experiences for you to keep evolving up instead of just throwing you into something that you're not ready for, because that is no good for anyone. So you have to, again, I'm going to go back to the wedding cake. You have to have a really good foundation and build upon that and have good memories to go back to to get to the next level. So, you know, I know you guys have challenges there in Michigan with, and we do in Illinois as well. We have a two, two event um, restriction. Um, our boys and girls are both in the fall. Um, so we have that restriction as well. And we're used to navigating around that. And you do have to make some choices of what you're going to do. But a, as I mentioned, a big part of what we do is sit down and look at your tournament schedule. What are you playing in? Where do you want to go? Because if you're not going to go to the big schools and the big times and the, the power fives, you probably never have to play in an AJGA event. We've worked with many. I've placed over 180 kids. And I would say half of those kids have never played in an AJGA event. And I've placed probably 60 of those kids have been division one. So it's not the end all be all. That is a brainwash moment for sure. And it, it's definitely a misconception. We call it fairway talk. Um, and we really try to, 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 to navigate against it because just because it's good for Sally doesn't mean it's good for Susie. And just because Sally's on this path doesn't mean that Susie is on the same path. Absolutely not. So everybody's navigating differently and everybody's going to progress differently. Great answer. Great to hear that. As coaches, do you, how do you view a student athlete that has played high school golf versus someone who has maybe foregone his senior year to play outside events? Does that, how does that influence you or how do you view that? So I'd love to share just two quick stories about two young ladies that I recruited that high school golf was extremely important to both of them. Um, so I was fortunate to win the recruiting battle um, for a young. So this is when I was at Bradley University, Division One, mid-major, as they say, Missouri Valley Conference. And I was recruiting a young lady from Nebraska who was one of the top recruits for them as well. Um, and she had won the state tournament in Nebraska four years in a row. And she had shot in the 60s at least two of those years. So to me she knew how to win in the highest levels of competition. So to me, that's the conversation with the better players. Listen, like to be able to say you're a state champion or to help your team be a state champion, like nobody can take that away from you. That is a distinction and an opportunity you only have for four years. And, you know, she chose to leave her state um, and she had a great career for us, but she is always a four-time Nebraska state champion. And how awesome is that? Um, and then I had a young lady, um, actually two um, young ladies who were, I think, two years apart who played on the same high school team in um, uh, the greater Chicago area. And, you know, they just had a winning culture. And those girls brought in so many great um, kind of habits of being on great teams. I think as high school coaches, if you can really focus on if you you aren't necessarily as competitive as 
the team next to you, like, how can you create successes for these kids in these coachable moments and these team building opportunities where they can then share those stories with coaches as they're being recruited? Um, you know, I had a young lady who played high school golf, but wasn't much of a, um, you know, her team didn't necessarily progress, but she was a leader. And that's something that really stood out to me. Um, so coaches are looking for those nuggets and those stories. And as high school coaches, you're leaders of these young people and you can create that environment for them. Um, and they're not necessarily going to get that if they decide just to play these independent events. So do you find that the majority of college players have played high school golf? I'd say so. I think in my time working with kids and then coaching, I've had a few here and there, or maybe, you know, one or two that um, they decided not to play for their last year or one of the years. Um, but most of them have at least tried it um, and played. I think, too, um, Debbie, I don't mean to cut you off, but I think, too, oh. once you get to college, golf is very much a team sport. So college coaches love and some of them actually seek out multi-sport athletes because golf can be pretty lonely, right? So if they can show a team atmosphere, if they can show that they play well with others, then that is really enticing for them because once you get to the college level, team first, individual second, for sure. So you've got to be about the big picture. It's not just about you. So you have to, whether that's a golf team or a basketball team, whatever is in the off season, we say our kind of rule of thumb is play everything you can until it becomes a disruption, until it becomes where you can't navigate both in an off season where you're having to make choices of your primary sport with your big tournaments, like their, your USGA, your, your state AMs, your things like that, that you can't miss. That's when it comes, that's when the fork comes and that's when you have to make your decision. I'm so glad that you mentioned the multi-sport athlete piece. Cause that's such a big part of, you know, the U S Olympic committee's American developmental model. That's incorporating all the governing bodies of golf and just really encouraging student athletes to be multi-sport and uh, college coaches look for that. As you said, um, yeah. you know, a, a student athlete that's done nothing but play golf since age four. Um, does that potentially raise some red flags for you as coaches? So to, um, to go deeper on this one young lady who I was uh, mentioning from the Chicago area, who was part of a successful team, she had played competitive soccer up till ninth grade and she started golf um, kind of more seriously in high school. And as a senior, she was probably in that class. I brought in three kids that year. She was either number two or three on my list. So she wasn't my top kid. But what caught my eye was her athleticism. She hit it a long way. And she was part of a really great, successful team. That kid came in and she didn't miss a tournament. She played every tournament. She might have been sick once. She played every tournament for four years. So um, I liked multi-sport athletes who came to golf a little bit later because I felt better about the fact that they wouldn't get burned out in college. Um, it is such a huge time commitment. Um, you know, just all the the travel, the pra you know, I could go through all the areas, but sometimes when you have a kid that starts really young, you just kind of scratch your head. Is, is that passion going to continue in college? Is college the destination or do they have more goals to chase? Um, and so frankly, I didn't get the cream of the crop when I was at Bradley. I had to search for the diamond in the rough and those multi-sport athletes who came to golf a little bit later, they were really attractive to me. And I can tell you, I wasn't the only coach going that route. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of us had to be creative. And that was a place where we knew, okay, this is a good place to look and a good place to ask some questions about. Awesome. Um, and being conscientious <laughs> with time, I wonder if we could take a look, if you guys could take a look at some of the questions in the chat yes, and maybe I address was, those. I was just going to say that. So um, what are NAI schools? So you have Indi Indiana Wesleyan. Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, um, University of Michigan, Dearborn, 
Marion University, Indiana, Madonna University, Southeastern University, Dalton State, Northwestern College, Iowa, Taylor University, San Ambrosia. Um, there are actually 180 schools in AIA that offer men's golf and 175 that offer women's golf. So, and just to give you a reference point, Division One, this was 200, uh, 2002, 20, 2022 numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, on the men's side, give or take a few, because some people became ineligible with a few things, um, recruiting and, and so forth in fractions. 305 on the D1, 277 on the women's. D2, 207 and 192 on the women's. And D3, 300 and 249 on the women's. So there's really a, I mean, 1300 schools that offer golf programs. So it's a lot more than you think. So let's see. I can take the question about um, juniors and seniors and it being too okay. late. Okay. You know, that's, that's the go, go button. <laughs> that is definitely the time where, um, you know, doing your research, being realistic, um, knowing where you match academically and athletically um, and, getting your story. So the thing we help our athletes with is them having one place where all their information is housed. That is maybe the only similarity we have to the larger companies that you may have heard of. So we have what we call an online presence for every kid where a coach can come, look at a swing video, look at a, a transcript, look at anything they need to know about this young person. And so really important for that person to be, um, you know, actively researching schools, telling their story in one place so a coach can get to know him or her, have some really great letters. And here's a little tidbit. Um, I rarely refused an in-person meeting if a young person in their family came to my campus and made the effort to come and visit. I would give somebody 10 or 15 minutes of my time, even if I thought they weren't somebody who was going to help me because I was always of the mindset well, she might not help me, but what if, you know, her future teammate, you know, hears about how great Bradley was, I just, or wash you or wherever it was, I just felt it was the right thing to do. Um, and so if they have dream schools or if they have schools rather that um, they realistically fit into, if they write a good letter and go for a visit, um, through admissions and then reach out to a coach, a coach may give him or her a few minutes of their time. Um, and nothing replaces a face-to-face in-person meet and greet. I mean, we're, we're human beings. And if somebody, you know, maybe I have a spot open up and this person walked into my office and she's getting a lot of academic money, you just never know. So that would be my advice to somebody who's pretty far down the line. Um, okay. I'm going to go with, um, the last two here. How is your, uh, team compensated for your efforts? Um, so our allegiance is with the family and the athlete. So the family and the athlete, the family pays us and we do our due diligence to make sure that we're finding the right fit for them. So even though that we have all of these relationship with, relationships with college coaches around the country, we need to make sure that we're protecting those as well. So, and an example of that would be, we're gonna protect that integrity. So. If, if, I'm going to go back to the example. If you're shooting 82, I'm not going to call the number two ranked school in NAIA to say, hey, I think you need to look at this person. I have to be very realistic and send you to realistic schools. So it's bad cop, good cop. And it's something I wanted to say earlier, which kind of ties into that, that exact um, comment is we had a panel in St. Louis and we had parents on it uh, last week. And one of the moms said, you know, the refreshing thing about you guys, you let me be a parent. I didn't have to be the bad guy that was telling her to do things because her answer, when I asked the question to the panel of athletes that we had worked with, I said, what was your most stressful experience in the college process? What, what stressed you out the most? And her answer was, you made me do things. You asked me to do stuff and I, I had to do it. And I was like, 
well, I didn't see that coming. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> see that coming. And, but then the mom quickly said, you gave her a to-do list and I could be a mom. So in that scenario, we could be the, the bad cop and they could just be a parent, but we're going to be realistic. And we're not in the, in the, in the world of squashing dreams by any measure, but you have to be realistic in, in where you're going. So th that was a very long winded story. So our, our allegiance is with the athlete. Um, we do get compensated by the family, uh, but we do protect our relationships with the coaches. So that's incredibly important to us too. Um, okay. Can I just jump in real quick with, so with yeah. the compensation, if, if you bring an eighth grader on board, is it like a yearly fee that you charge or as you work them through, is it how to just without going into numbers, but just how the process works that way? Yeah. So that's a great question. So we give the family options. So we have a yearly consulting fee. We also have it. So our eighth graders, we give them two options. One is through their sophomore year. So May 31st of their sophomore year. So we give them that time frame, or we give them through the end. We like to speak in language of when we get here, when we become a junior, when we do this. We, li we like to talk in all in, but we understand things happen, things change. So we give them two proposals on the onset of right after we meet. So we have a yearly contract. That yearly contract is mostly for seniors that don't have a lot of time left and they just need some help give me some guidance or the very young that just need, we just started working with a nine-year-old. She's on a yearly contract because she just needs help with what to play in, how to navigate her and how she can deal with burnout. Very so exceptional circumstance. Very <laughs> exceptional circumstance. Very, that is not normal. We're working with. <laughs> but we're going to be building an awesome foundation for this young lady. But to give a little bit of backstory, she is in a very remote area in Virginia. So she does not have a lot of access to uh, a lot of tournaments or things around her. So we're going to be building her up um, as it's appropriate. So, but along those lines too, it, it differs. So we want to be all in, but we give our young kids two options through sophomore year or through the end. And then our sophomores and juniors, it is one proposal that we would give throughout so and again it nothing is in stone um you know that's the, that's the wonderful thing about having the flexibility of not being cookie cutter if there's something you don't want we can take it out even though we're not an a la carte business i i hate saying that but we offer a lot of things that are awesome and we think bring such great value to what we're doing but if you don't want it we'll we'll take it out so, but we're very mindful of the economic situation of everybody. And we, you know, I think that's our fault. We want to help everybody just can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can, can you speak briefly? You mentioned how, you know, you do everything you can, that you also work with nutritionists and mental and like conditioning people that you'll provide for the student athlete mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So we've done our due diligence and it's either relationships that the two of us have built over the years and we've been very um, specific about aligning ourselves with people. We've, you know, met a bunch of different companies and individuals and vetted them. So we've got somebody who does a personality profile specific to golf. We have found that hugely valuable. Um, we do have a sports psychologist here in St. Louis um, who can do remote, but, you know, doesn't have to do that either. I do have some background in Olympic performance and I'm actually going through mental golf type, which Debbie, I think you're familiar with through the LPGA. So I do help a lot of our kids on that side of things. Um, and I actually do some performance coaching, but um, in addition to that, we've got fitness people, um, some who are willing to do remote. Um, and it's always a, listen, if you have somebody local that's recommended that you do your research and you like that person, absolutely. We're not trying to sell them additional services. We're just trying to provide options. Um, another resource we have is um, ACT and SAT prep. Um, there's a company that's a small company like us. And um, one of the three owners had a perfect ACT score. 
Um, and he has written a proprietary test where the kids in an hour and a half can figure out, are they better for the SAT or the ACT? Um, and so um, we have aligned with them in test prep. So we really, you know, kind of anybody in the industry, we've got somebody um, on the strategy side of golf, which is kind of the next thing. If you've heard of Decade, they're not. this is not Decade, it's somebody else. Um, he's a PGA member out of Nashville who has a big um, learning program um, with juniors and adults. Um, and sometimes we even take our kids down to see him as well. So we really want to provide value in because a lot of times we'll get on a call and a kid saying like, I'm losing gas on the back nine. Well, let's talk about what you've been eating. And, you know, at a certain point, we don't want to give advice in areas that we, you know, we want to stay in our lane. So if we really feel like, you know, this young person needs to talk to a dietitian or nutritionist, we want to get them to that right person. Mary, too, you mentioned about uh, the student athletes, making sure they test. Yes. You were going to speak yes. to that. Yeah. Yes. Let's go back to that. So here's the thing about testing. Um, and I think college, a lot of colleges are swinging back the other way and um, now suggesting the testing again. So it just opens more doors. So what I mean by that is let's say you show up at a university and we know almost all divisions, there is academic money available you're going to differentiate yourself and maybe get more scholarship if you've got a higher test score. Um, a lot of schools are using them for um, honors programs. So maybe it's, you know, a great athlete who is looking for a really challenging education and wants that honors program. He or she may not even be considered if they're not taking a standardized test. So, and let's put Apple's to apples here, if I have a young person, you know, two young ladies I'm recruiting who are about the same ability, I really like them off the golf course, meaning I like the, you know, what they're going to bring to my team culture. And one is getting more academic money than the other. That means I can stretch my athletic dollars a lot further. So why would I not take a kid who's getting more academic money? Because as a coach um, at the D1 level, women's golf is six full scholarships men is four and a half if you're fully funded and that way I can have maybe one more person on my team because I can split that athletic money up a little bit so you know we always want more options we always want more open doors and then um, we also help our seniors apply for and research outside scholarships and a lot of those you'll differentiate yourself with a test score so it, it's really a no-brainer um can you just speak briefly to club golf and PGM opportunities and explain PGM for maybe some of our coaches not familiar with it. Yeah. Um, Tanya, is it 16? Is that the number? 15? Okay. So um, just so you know, we've placed a young lady at Mississippi State um, in the PGM program. So there's 16 across the country, all divisions, not NAIA. So division one, division two, division three. Um, and at some of them, it's conceivable to both play on the team and study in the major. So the professional golf management major is typically some sort of business degree paired with the PGA of America standards for becoming a member of the PGA of America. So it's either four or four and a half years. You have internships built into your time over the summers. Um, a lot of them have playing opportunities outside of the varsity golf program. So if you're at the University of Nebraska, we just um, had him um, at an event last week and we got to learn about his program. Um, they play a, a number of events on their campus courses and then they also have kids who qualify and travel and play on behalf of the university. So you can really get a very similar experience to a college golf experience playing on a varsity team. They're all quite different. We've, you know, started to get to know a lot of them. We have a young lady from Maine who is specifically looking but wants to play at the same time. So there are some in Division Two and Division Three that it's much more conceivable to do both. Um, Mississippi State, Florida Gulf Coast in Florida, Nebraska, a lot of those, it's pretty hard to do both. Um, I will say it's also a great opportunity for um, the females 
Um, Debbie, you know this pretty well, like our industry is really seeking out growing um, the numbers of females in the business. And so um, if you've got maybe a player who's not quite ready um, to play that full gamut of division one, division two golf, she can still go and get this degree and play on a, a competitive team and have an experience. So they're all different. Um, a lot of them have aligned themselves with different clubs to do those internships and they're very good at marketing themselves. So with some research, you can find out like Nebraska had a whole graphic of where they were sending their people and, you know, don't think just golf professionals, um, you know, you've got to think across the industry. They're training um, young people to be um, tour fitters, um, work for the PJ of America or LPGA and administration. I mean, it's across golf the industry. Yeah, yeah, the golf channel. I mean, it's golf channel, you name it. Um, so it's a really exciting area that um, I think the PGA is trying to market it better. And like I said, we're in the business of knowing much more about it. So we're in the, um, you know, the trenches with this young lady from Maine right now and helped this other young lady from Mississippi State. And then real briefly, club golf. Um, that is sanctioned, I believe, by the PGA as well. Um, there is a website that's centralized where you can search by state and you can find out which universities have club golf and there's usually a contact. Um, but it's strictly institutional as to how they're funded. You know, some of the kids have to pay for their own travels, some don't. Some have very competitive programs, some don't. Some practice, you know, let's say Purdue as an example, they own a golf course, so they practice on campus. Some do not. So it's just another area where you have to kind of do some research, but it's a great option and it's open to boys and girls as well. Yep. Um, I want to make sure we get to some of these questions real fast because I want to be yeah. to time because we're losing some people here. So do you ask a player if they're going to play beyond college? Um, so I actually stole this from a football coach. Um, we call it the 440, or this coach did. So it's the next four years that set you up for the next 40 of your life. So we come at it from, and we always say, if you don't have golf in your life, would you still want to go to this school? So with that in mind, it's very much academic driven. It's very much listen, you have to like the culture, you have to like the school, you have to like the geography, you have to like the weather. You have to like everything about this, this option, or it's not a good option for you. Because we don't, if something happens in, you know, God forbid you break your arm, some leg, something happens, you, you can't play golf. We don't want you calling us saying, get me out of here. That's the, if that's the case, it's not a good option for you. So, um, Hopefully that answered your question. It is about the big picture. We're trying to create strong adults um, getting out to the world. So you mentioned earlier that scoring is coming back is an evaluation tool for the coaches. Might you explain? Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, um, but I'll, um, you know, um, score golf is a numbers game and score always has something to do at the end of the day. Um, I think what you, what I would like to say at this point, when you're looking at colleges and you're looking at rosters, college coaches are never looking to replace their five and six. They're looking to replace their two and three. So they're always looking to get better. So when you're looking at a roster and saying, I can shoot that, well, what are you, you're not looking at the lower part of the roster. You need to be looking at the top part of the roster to be in the mix of that because college coaches are trying to improve their team to get up in rankings. I think that's really important. Um, and that was mirrored by the, the college coach that we had on our panel last week said, very well said, that's exactly right. We're not, we're not trying to replace five and six. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to get better as well. So I think we have answered everything. I can take maybe this one. So the subpar at a par three. So it's really important when kids report their results that they're also reporting 
the finish they had. So the score, the finish and the length of the golf course. You're absolutely right. Coaches, if you shoot under par on a, you know, for um, a young man on a 5,500 yard golf course, that's not going to mean much, but if it's, you know, high 6,000s, low, um, you know, 7,000s, that's going to turn some eyes. So, you know, you have to be honest about your results and where they're coming from. Um, Great. All right. So Tanya and Mary, this has just been awesome. And I, I know our coaches so appreciate all the information that you had. Um, I can honestly say I've been on a lot of, not a lot, but numerous uh, events and webinars and stuff with college recruiting. And, and this is by far the best that I've been exposed to and the most information, but also just the most comfort in, in knowing your goals and, and what your initiatives are with honesty and integrity. So for all of our coaches out there, uh, this has been recorded. So we'll have it available for you to kind of go back if you have things that you wish you had more notes on. And then also, if you have a desire to get a hold of RSA, you can reach out to me and I can provide you all their contact information and, and uh, get you going with some, some great help. So um, does that all sound good? Are we good? Thank you, Debbie. Really appreciate it. And best of luck to you guys um, with your vote in May. I know you're wanting to get a, a bigger number of tournaments. So good luck with all of that. And, you know, best of luck to everyone this coming this coming season and summer. Um, hope you have a great summer. And yeah, thank you, Debbie, for having us. We really appreciate the time and the opportunity to chat with your coaches. I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all. Good, hey, good night. night, everyone. Good night. Good night.